I'm stupid. I'm actually stupid. Hello, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new. My name is Chandler, and I do bookish things here. I have to explain kind of where this idea came from before I can even get into what this video is going to be. I decided that I wanted to explore romance, right? I was going to look for the top 10 best romances of all time, and I didn't expect that there would be any sort of like consensus on what the best romances were, but I thought that at least like the romance award giving people would have some sort of list of like best all time romances or, you know, something like I could find something out there. And um, I found nothing, or at least I'm just not very good at Google searching one of the two. But I did come across this article by BuzzFeed, which is the top 27 romances to leave you hot and bothered. And I thought, what if I read them all and ranked them on how hot and bothered I actually got? So um, over the next few months, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read all 27 of these books and let you know if they get me hot and bothered. This is going to be fun. I'm kind of excited about it. Is it a stupid idea? Like, yeah, it is, but um, I'm stupid, so. There you go. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a good time. Am I gonna be hot and bothered? Like, we'll, we'll see. So this lighting is making me look like I'm in heaven, but let me assure you, I'm in hell. This did not go how I had planned. I don't want to spoil anything for you, but if you like rant reviews, stay tuned, because that's exactly what this is going to be. I didn't really know very much going into this, obviously. I picked this list from BuzzFeed and I was like, it's gonna be a good time. All of these books were written prior to 2015, which I didn't think would be such a big deal, but let me tell you, it's a huge fucking deal when it comes to romance because all of these were just something which we're just we're gonna jump into it and I'll show you guys like why that is the case why everything um just didn't work out so good I have no idea how long this video is gonna be but I've got notes I'm ready I'm strapped in I'm caffeinated we're gonna talk about these romances <sighs> Okay, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be great. Number 27, 10 Tiny Breaths by K.A. Tucker. Right off the bat, we're starting off with a book that I could not bring myself to finish. As someone who reads a lot of new adult romance, this started out like any bottom of the barrel new adult romance starts out. Uh, for the uncultured, new adult romance is a romance category ages 18 to 30 that focuses on kind of self-development and what you want out of life. Pretty much anything that a college student would go through, it's kind of for college-aged people or people that are right out of college. So for this romance, we start out with a girl named Casey, and she is coming from God knows where, but her parents have died and left her life insurance money. But oh no, her evil uncle and aunt have gambled away all of her money. So Casey is penniless, and she doesn't want her sister to end up, I don't know, in a life of prostitution. And so Casey decides she's gonna go to Miami for, I have no fucking clue why, like she just decides Miami is the destination for her. She ends up shacking up in a shitty apartment. She ends up working as a bartender at a strip joint with her so slutty next door neighbor, and she ends up falling for her next door neighbor named Trent. Now, even ignoring the blatant sexism and slut shaming from our main character, Casey, the romance and the believability of said romance is really what got to me. The catalyst for our two characters, Bump and Uglies, was essentially Casey's in her shower, she sees what she thinks is a snake, and she comes screaming out of the bathroom naked or like wet, and um, she runs into Trent. And God knows why he's in her fucking apartment, but he somehow miraculously saves her from this snake. Thank God. Overall, I think from a scale of hot to bothered, I'm just bothered. Number 26, Seduction and Snacks by Tara Sybeck. So this is one of the strangest books on this list. I honestly don't know how it wound up on this list or how people genuinely enjoyed it. It's not that it's objectively horrible, but a lot of it just left me feeling like, what the fuck? So let me read a passage, the first chapter to you guys, so you can kind of get a feel on what I'm talking about. The first chapter is titled Arby's Anyone, and it is a monologue on why children suck. And I quote, the simple truth is, I never thought pushing a tiny human out of me that turns my cooter into something resembling roast beef that no man would ever want to look at, let alone bang, was a stellar idea. You know, I think it's time to turn my box into Arby's beef and cheddar minus the cheddar and saddle myself down for a minimum of 18 years to someone who will suck the soul and the will to live right out of my body, so I'm a shell of the person I used to be and can't get laid even if I pay for it. And it does not get much better from there. You'd think that a romance that doesn't take itself too seriously would be kind of fun and different and delightful compared to all of the like Fifty Shades knockoffs that I'm going to review in a minute. But unfortunately, the tryhardness interrupted the narrative of the story itself. I'd be lying to you guys if I said that I didn't end up skimming some of these books, but it was nearly impossible to skim in this one because I couldn't tell if it was just Claire's inane rambling or if it was something that was important to the narrative of the story. So it was just kind of hard to slog my way through. And on top of that, the entire plot line is that this girl loses her virginity at a frat party, gets knocked up the first time she ever has sex, which I mean, I'm sure it happens in real life, but like who the fuck does that actually happen to? And she never gets the guy's name. She 
doesn't know who he is and she miraculously meets him five years later and he ends up wanting to step up and be there for the kid and he's also in love with her and they've like been waiting for each other this whole time I'm like who the fuck does that happen to like that doesn't happen to people ever does it let me know does that ha has that happened to you so overall I didn't enjoy the romance and I really didn't enjoy the humor so it's not hot but I'm not entirely bothered because it did something different you know it's it's kind of zesty a little bit up from bothered but not hot number 25 the bride by Julie Garwood more like the kidnapped because that's what this book is this is about a violent and powerful Scottish warlord who comes and finds an English bride he can choose between three of these sisters and of course he chooses the most feisty and sexy of all of them you know it's like this trope has been done to death and maybe Julie Garwood did something super different and innovative maybe she was one of the first to do this I think this book was written in either the 90s or the 80s and so again maybe she was the first to kind of make this trope come into being and existence but unfortunately I don't know because I didn't finish this book I just wasn't taken with it and I think the dynamic between our main heroine and hero just didn't work out so well he kidnaps her. I don't know, I just don't know that romance can really be built from a kidnapping, or at least in this case it definitely couldn't, from what I read of it. It's very demanding and like, obey your husband and shit. And I know that might have been like the standard back in the day, but that's just not something that I personally want to read about. If I kept reading, would I have been enamored? Me thinks not, so I'm bothered. Number 24, A Knight in Shining Armor by Jude Devereaux. So this is another historical romance. It is about a girl who gets visited by an English soldier from Elizabethan England after she gets abandoned by her surgeon boyfriend in England at a church, and that's sort of the catalyst for this whole goddamn story. I didn't end up finishing this book, as is the case for a handful of books on this list, as you can probably tell, because I have already seen Kate and Leopold, and that's basically what the fuck this book is. This might have been amazing, but I really could not stand our naive heroine, and I didn't like the whole guy who doesn't really understand modern currency and clothing. Like, it wasn't cute to me. If you want that trope, just watch the fucking movie. Like, you don't need this book. I'm not saying the movie was based on the book, but I'm just saying you don't need to read this book. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, entertaining. I wasn't here for it and the girl's name is Douglas, so I'm bothered. Number 23, Mystery Man by Kristen Ashley. So I took notes while I was reading these books, as you can probably tell, I have my phone with me and I'm reading from these notes. And the only single note that I had from this book before I put it down was, no, I love myself too much for that. This is a completely fitting sentiment for how this book opens, and it is a lot to handle. Our character has not only been sleeping with a man for a year who she does not know, and I don't mean in a, oh, we're just fuck buddies kind of way. I mean, like, she literally does not know this man's identity. It could be Freddy fucking Krueger in her bed and she would have no goddamn idea. But She's also caught up in motorcycle gang violence. And let me be clear, I think one night stands are a great thing. I think motorcycle romances are fine. The way this one was set up, uh, I didn't love. The writing was stupid. I didn't think that our heroine was particularly inspiring in any way or had a personality that I would want to read about for an entire book. Uh, so I had to yeet myself out of there with a swiftness. Uh, I'm bothered. <laughs> Number 22, Real by Katie Evans. Ladies, is it sexy for a man to be tranquilized in the jugular during a supposedly manic episode because he goes crazy because he just can't find you? You? let me know. So I've read this book before and let me tell you it did not get better the second time around. It's about a sports therapist named Brooke who after seeing this underground fighter do his thing ends up becoming his sports therapist and eventually of course they bone. The premise of this book was really not that bad I just think the execution was really lacking because Brooke was the ultimate slut shamer of all of the books that I read Brooke was easily the most hateable. She ends up going to the first underground fighting ring uh, situation. She's in a cardigan, sensible shoes, and a pearl fucking necklace and no woman is immune for her criticism. Her sister, a slut. Her best friend is a whore. She verbalizes these things, she thinks these things, and I'm just like, have you ever met a woman you like? I would love to know. But despite all of her bullshit, our hero, Remington Riptide Tate, simply must have her because of course she's not like other girls, and our girl Brooke is enamored with him despite her reservations because he is muscular and he has basically everything that she would want to be as an athlete. I think she ends up having some sort of injury, like she used to be some sort of sports player, like a runner or some shit her ACL got ruptured and then she just she admires his big sexy strong body which we don't fucking stop hearing about the entire book let me tell you she is constantly describing how her tummy knots up whenever she sees this dude and how her sex muscles clench ew David when she's around him and she's always describing to us how much smarter she is than everyone else she tries to explain what an ACL injury is and what ACL even stands for and it's just like you're fucking insufferable but I think the real kicker in this book is the horrible misuse and misrepresentation of bipolar disorder uh, 
Uh, as I was saying or making light of in the beginning of this clip, Remington goes apeshit every time he's having a supposedly manic episode, and I'm sorry, just because you have bipolar does not turn you into the fucking Hulk. Table flipping, having to be tranquilized, like that is not symptomatic of bipolar disorder or a manic episode. Nothing about Riptide's Hulk displays or this book made me want to grind my nubbin against a hard thigh, so I am bothered. 21. Tangled by Emma Chase. So Tangled is what would happen if Christian Grey had a personality and if the story was told from his perspective. For example, one of the opening lines of the book is, I can't help it if they see me, fuck me, and suddenly want to bear my children. And I honestly think what fucks me up so much about this particular book is the fact that it is written by a woman, and I'm like, who did you think the audience for this book was going to be? Does she think this is what men sound like? Does she think this is what women want? Because romance is usually written for women by women, so the choices made here were pretty odd to say the least. So the story itself is about this hotshot finance guy in New York. He ends up meeting this girl at a bar, but oh no, she's engaged. But did you know that engagement is not the same thing as marriage and that any old asshole can harass you at a bar and insist that your body language means that you still definitely want a bone? Anyway, the girl at the bar who's engaged, she ends up being this hotshot asshole's like coworker. It's her first day the next day and he has to kind of face this and they're forced to work together. It's sort of an enemies to lovers situation. She ends up dumping her shitty fiance and they end up getting together after, you know, some like plot shit happens. I'm pretty torn here because the banter and the workplace enemies to lovers thing really worked for me. But every time I started to like the main character, he started saying some misogynistic shit about how all the women ever around him eat salads and not steak and this bitch she eats steak so she's different and of course not like other girls. So I think for this I'm gonna put the book in the middle. I'm not completely bothered, not completely hot, but there were some steamy scenes and despite uh, my initial reservations this book didn't end up being quite that bad so I'm gonna put it smack dab in the middle. Okay I changed locations I had a snack if you see any Cadbury mini eggs in my teeth say less. Number 20 I Can't Think Straight by Shamim Sarif. Can I tell you a secret? Much like a 10th grader who doesn't want to read Shakespeare I ended up renting the movie adaptation of this book because I just was not feeling it. It was kind of hard to get through. It was kind of stilted writing. And so I figured, you know what? There's a movie out there. It's directed by the person that wrote the book. Surely it's going to be a faithful adaptation. And from what I read of the book, it definitely was. The one thing this book really has going for it is the fact that it is not about straight white people. Love to see it, you know? After all the shit that I was put through for this video, it was nice to kind of spice things up, especially since this is one of the last books that I read for this video. Anyway, it is about two women. One is an Indian Muslim. Muslim. One is a Palestinian Christian and it is about them kind of trying to be together and deal with the cultural differences they have and the different expectations from their families. I feel like the idea behind this book was really great. I think it is, from what I understand, a semi-autobiographical book. So the author definitely had some investment in the story, but unfortunately I just feel like the execution was not there. The book is only a little bit over 200 pages and the movie adaptation was only an hour and a half and it was a lot of tell and not show. We didn't really understand why these characters would be together. It's like one tennis match and they're committed to being together forever. And tennis is not like sexy, you know? Tennis is not something that makes me think, oh fuck, let's be together forever. This was just like, whatever. I was mostly bored during the movie. I was not bothered. I was not hot. I was just bored. Number 19, Once Burned by Janine Frost. Have you ever wanted to know what a circus sideshow performer in Vlad the Impaler boning would look like? Look no further. For some reason, from this cover, I was assuming that we would be getting just a traditional bog standard vampire romance, but no, it's something more akin to AHS freak show. Janine really went that extra mile with the creativity for you and for me. This circus performer in particular can shoot lightning bolts out of her fingertips and she also has the ability to see the future and I think perhaps read minds. She gets in trouble when she ends up reading the mind of someone she's not supposed to and she ends up getting captured by Vlad the fucking Impaler. But of course he is beyond taken with the circus freak and he just must have her and that is the majority of this book. They're trying to find out who is trying to kill Vlad and Vlad is trying to bone the circus sideshow freak. It was interesting. As someone who easily gets hot and bothered by vampire books, I was surprised by the lack of loin tingling I felt when these two finally cleaned the cobwebs, if you know what I'm saying. I think a big part of it was the whole circus thing. It just really didn't do it for me. Like I mentioned, it's got that sort of like AHS feel and I was just picturing the guy that rips the heads off of chickens in that show and it just kind of killed any buzz or zest that I could have possibly felt from the story. This is not a bad book per se, but it's not something that I would call hot. It gets bonus points for having consent and uh, for being an overall decent story. So I'm gonna put this one in Eh? Number 18, The Mighty Storm by Samantha Towell. Do you enjoy fan fiction, fetishization of Latinx women, and drug addiction to make a hero sexy? Oh, and cheating? I've got the book for you. The Mighty Storm is about True and Jake, who were childhood best friends, and they both kind of connected over their mutual love of music. Flash forward a few years, and True and Jake have lost touch. True ends up being a music journalist, and Jake is the lead singer of the well-known band, The Mighty Storm. They haven't seen each other in years, until True is charged with interviewing Jake after he has recently come back from rehab. But don't 
worry. Even though they have spent years apart, Jake could not forget an ass that looks just like JLo's. Yeah, that's actually something our heroine says about herself. And so begins the saddest, and by saddest, I mean most pathetic romance on this list. Drew has a fantastic boyfriend, but why bother with him when she has a famous rock star that can really churn her butter? The story is about Drew going on tour with Jake, and of course, she is battling internally with whether or not Jake even likes her, and if Jake does like her, could she leave her just super fucking nice boyfriend for him? The answer is yes. The answer is she is going to cheat on her boyfriend multiple times throughout the course of the story. He is going to be absolutely gutted. I hate it here, and I am bothered. Number 17, Maybe Someday by Colleen Hoover. The cheating train don't stop, baby. This is for the girls who want a hot singer-songwriter to cheat on their terminally ill girlfriend for them. That's literally all this book is. It is about a girl whose boyfriend cheats on her. She ends up going live with her next-door neighbor who happens to be a singer-songwriter, and she ends up falling for him while they write lyrics to some of the music that he has composed. But oh no, he has a girlfriend that loves him. Does he? And would definitely never cheat on her. He does. This book was such a mess, and I think the author, much like the author in The Mighty Storm, pulls on the creativity of the singer-songwriter and tries to make them sympathetic in that way, that music brings people together, and for some reason, you should cheat on your significant other because you feel this sort of musical connection to this other girl. And it was just gross, and I didn't like the fact that he is supposed to stay with this girl who's terminally ill. It is pointed out by her that it's pretty fucked up that he would, like, mentally think that. Oh, well, she's terminally ill, I just gotta stay with her instead of being with a girl that I really love. Like, it does a complete disservice to the girl that you're already with. I didn't care what happened, I just really wanted the two girls to end up leaving him and end up together because that would have been a more satisfying conclusion to this book. I'm bothered. Number 16, A Kingdom of Dreams by Judith McNaught. So this one was actually dare I say good? It is set in Tudor England and our heroine Jennifer is Scottish and she ends up being kidnapped from a convent by the Black Wolf of England, this notorious warrior Royce Westmoreland. And the majority of the story is Jennifer kind of trying to get away from Royce and Royce ending up falling for Jennifer. I thought this was actually pretty solid. This is one of the few books on this list that I thought was worth the read. And I think that is due in part to the fact that this book was longer than any of the books that I read. Our author really took the time to flesh out our characters to make us understand understand why they would do very well together. I super enjoyed Jennifer as a character. I felt like she had a very strong personality. I liked her attempts to escape Royce. I liked Royce's grumpiness. I think it worked really well together. And unlike the sequel to this book that I read before I read the first book, there is none of that sort of like dubious, weird consent thing. They definitely both really are into each other. And even though there's sort of like a Stockholm Beauty and the Beast thing going on, it was hot and I was sort of here for it. Number 15, Addicted by Zane. This is a tale of nub and rub and fiendishness. So we open up with our main character, Zoe, going to a therapy appointment and at her therapy appointment she is telling her therapist about what has led her to this place and so we get her background from basically middle school all the way up into her adult life. She ends up marrying her middle school sweetheart. They end up forming a relationship over the years. They like break up, get back together, etc. And we get to see that through Zoe's eyes. The majority of the book is her describing how much she loves him and yet she still feels compelled to cheat on him because she is uncomfortable sharing her sexual desires. We then end up learning about Zoe's two sexual partners and the kind of relationship that she builds with both both of them, both, uh, spoiler, are fucking insane, but she doesn't know that from the beginning and she ends up just engaging in wild and rampant sex with them. Oh, and also guess what? Zoe's sexual desires are a direct result of trauma that she faced as a child and her husband and his standoffish ways about sex are also a result of trauma that he has faced as a child. This book had such great potential because I felt like the storytelling was really unique and different from anything else that I'd read and I like the unique voice that Zane brings to each of her characters, but also just talk to your husband, like get counseling. If you wanna engage in a relationship that's maybe a little kinky and you don't know how to say that. It's like you're comfortable enough going to a therapist on your own. Why not bring your husband into it? I wouldn't say that I was bothered reading this book, but I definitely wasn't hot. Anyway, this was kind of a fun read and it honestly blew my mind when I looked it up after reading. So this book was written in 1998. It definitely had that sort of like 50 shades of gray, crazy, plot twisty, kind of thrillery feel to it. So if you're into that sort of thing, I think you actually might like this book. I think I'm gonna leave this in the kind of middle. I wasn't bored, I wasn't hot, I wasn't bothered. Like, I don't know how to feel about this book, but it was like kind of interesting. Number 14, Archer's Voice by Mia Sheridan. This is what would happen if Nicholas Sparks wrote a porno about a hot Boo Radley type and a girl who came to town after her family died. Archer's Voice is a story about a mute, reclusive guy named Archer and a girl that comes to town named Bree who's kind of escaping her past and some of the trauma in it. She treats him like a skittish dog for a while, but eventually she's able to tame him, cut his hair, shave his beard, and she figures out, oh my god, Archer's so fucking hot. Also, in typical Nicholas Sparks fashion, it is not enough to have our characters have traumatic pasts. They end up having to fight some like crazy, wild plot twists near the end of this book. Overall, this book was kind of fun to read. This is my second time reading it, and it was just as enjoyable 
enjoyable the second time around. If you want a wholesome romance with consent and self-development for your characters, this might be a book for you. I wouldn't say that it was hot, but I also wasn't bothered and I did appreciate the character development. So we're gonna put it two steps below hot, but definitely not bothered. Number 13, Promises by Marie Sexton. I'm gonna be real with you, Chief. I did not want to spend $7 on this and I could not get it from the library for the life of me. The lukewarm reviews really did not make me want to pick this up. And to be honest with you, there are plenty of amazing male-male romances out there. And I don't think this is gonna be one of them. If you're looking for something good to read in the male-male sphere, I would definitely say Wolf Song by TJ Klune or Heated Rivals by Rachel Reed. I'm not upset that I didn't read this. We're gonna move along. Number 12, The Bronze Horseman by Polina Simons. I wanted no part in a historical fiction book set in World War II mired with abuse apology. An actual quote from the hero when he is physically restraining our heroine was, I married you so I could fuck you anytime I want. Fuck no to that, I say. I am bothered. Number 11, The Edge of Never by J.A. Redmersky. So I hated this book in 2016 and I hate it even more in 2020. Did you know that thinking about the smell of rain makes you deeper than your best friend who only thinks about new sexual positions with her boyfriend? This book was bad. It was about a girl who ends up leaving her hometown after some dramatic shit goes down with her best friend and she doesn't really know what she's doing or where she's going, but she hops on a Greyhound bus and on the bus she ends up meeting love of her life, this amazing guy. He's just like so fucking great and it's about their like romance or whatever. I understand what the author was trying to do with the whole forced proximity and oh my god, like we hate each other's music, like <laughs> quirky, like enemies to lovers bullshit. But this is the kind of book for girls who end up hanging out with guys rather than girls because guys are less drama. Needless to say, I'm bothered. Number 10, Beauty from Pain by Georgia Cates. Imagine, it's two years after the juggernaut that is Fifty Shades of Grey was published and you're a romance writer wanting to follow a familiar formula while also adding some spicy changes. And nothing says spicy more than Australian accents. So let's make him an Australian stalker. And instead, of a generic billionaire businessman, let's make him a vineyard owner because nothing says sexy like wine. And we can't forget our heroine, personality unneeded, but nothing says soulful like singer songwriter. So let's have a girl visit the Outback for three months and agree to a no strings attached sexual relationship with a guy that tracked her down from a bar. And that my friends is Beauty From Pain by Georgia Cates. The sex was rampant and uninteresting. The relationship had little development aside from this boring sex. And the cliffhanger ending was easily the weakest of all of the shit that I've read for this entire video. Beyond the setup for this relationship being a little bit stalkery, it was mostly unproblematic, so I'm not bothered, just bored. Number nine, Edenbrook by Julianne Donaldson. This was hands down the most surprising book on this list. When I went into it, I was a little bit hesitant because all of the reviews that I read said this was going to be a clean, wholesome romance, which I don't fucking do. This was definitely a knockoff Pride and Prejudice where the Elizabeth character is more of a shy and Shirley type and the Darcy character is a little bit more outgoing and flirty. And I ate that shit up quicker than hot dogs at a hot dog eating contest. Maybe it was because most of the books on this list ended up being two stars for me. This one just was good. I mean, there was nothing really wrong with it. Was it clean? Was it wholesome? Yes. Was there any boning? No. But the Mr. Darcy character made me swoon so hard that I almost forgot that there was no bedroom rodeoing. I definitely wasn't bothered by this book. I also wouldn't say that it was super hot since again, there was no boning. Overall, I really enjoyed this book. I'm gonna put it one step down from hot. I'm making progress, people. I found a book that I actually enjoyed. <laughs> Number eight. Wait For You by Jay Lynn. This book is called Wait For You, but it should have been called Wait For This Book To Get Interesting or Don't because you'll be dead before that fucking happens. This book wasn't terrible, but it also wasn't very exciting. Our main character is suffering because she was sexually assaulted back home at the age of 14 and nobody in her life believes her. She ends up escaping her family to go to West Virginia for college and she ends up meeting this hot shot big man on campus who ends up really wanting to form a relationship with her because of course she's not like other girls. She is not traditionally flirty or like into dudes, I guess. I mean, she's into guys, but she has no interest in a sexual relationship and so this guy keeps asking her out every time they hang out. They develop a friendship that turns into a relationship and that's pretty much this book. The guy is super supportive. There's a lot of consent. They eventually do end up, you know, doing the deed, which is great, but also uninteresting and not hot. And to be honest with you, I kind of wish that I could get the time back that I spent reading this book. I was bored. Number seven, Collide by Gail McHugh. How is it possible for a book to be so forgettable and yet so bad? This was like Fifty Shades of Grey, but instead of BDSM, we got a terrible love triangle. And when I say a bad love triangle, I mean a lazy love triangle. I think as a society, we've been duped into thinking that love triangles are somehow bad, but I think the issue is that all of the love triangles we've read have been lazy. And by lazy, I mean making one of the legs of the triangle an antagonist and a guy that our main character should never end up with. And in this case, our heroine is with one of the legs of the triangle. He's a psychologically abusive douchebag, and of course we're rooting for her to get with the other guy the entire time that this book is going on. And to be honest with you, I just really fucking hated this book. I hated the lack of consent that happens at the very end of the book, and overall it was just bad. This was easily my least favorite book 
book that I read for this whole video, I'm bothered. Number six, On Dublin Street by Samantha Young. On Dublin Street, more like Shake in the Sheets. Okay, that was really bad, please ignore that. This was one of the more creative books that I read, but I definitely wouldn't say that it paid off. So the story is about a girl whose family dies and she takes the life insurance money and what does she do with it? She goes to Ireland, of course, because she wants to be a writer and she wants to be surrounded by nature and the beauty of it. And she's also a bartender while she's in Ireland to help kind of pay for some of her expenses and to get out of the house. In the cab on the way to meet her new roommate, she ends up being stuck with this super, super hot guy. Oh shit, it's actually her roommate's brother. And that's sort of what the story is. It's about this girl falling for this kind of hot shot, Christian Grey, like billionaire, flirty, fun guy. This book was bad primarily because it's long and we see so much of our main character insisting that she has no time for a romantic relationship because she is still very much grieving the deaths of all of her fucking family. But the hero in the story just doesn't listen to her. He's not physically creepy at all, but he definitely comes on very strong and is definitely insistent that there is something there and eventually they engage in a sexual relationship. All the while, our main character is insisting that she is not developing romantic feelings for this guy because again, she's grieving. I really didn't like this relationship. It didn't feel too sided. I didn't feel like our main character's needs were being met and I also feel like she had way more chemistry with the roommate rather than her roommate's brother. Anyway, this was far from the worst thing that I read for this video, but it definitely didn't do anything for me, and I ended up being pretty bored. Number five, Fallen Too Far by Abby Glines. So the first thing that was evident when I turned on the audio for this book was that it was going to be a fish out of water story. Poor girl lamenting the death of her mother with a country accent. Yeah, she's gonna fall for a rich boy. It's just fate. Anyway, her name is Blair, and she's going to stay with her deadbeat dad because her mom died. And her dad left in the first place because her twin sister died, so everyone in Blair's life is pretty much dead. But oh no, daddy's not there, so step bro, Rush, offers her room under the stairs. Let's make the 19-year-old girl feel like Harry Potter. After a series of very cyclical events that involves Blair and Rush, fighting their urges and Blair getting teased for being a hick, they finally give in to fate and Blair gets deflowered by Rush. Although it seems to be important to note this did not happen under the stairs and it also didn't happen with Blair being caught in an open window. The last 20 pages of the book end up fighting that whole cyclical plot thing and we get more of a kind of gossip girl situation where we find out more about Blair and her life and kind of the mysterious circumstances surrounding her mom's death, so I will give it points for the drama factor. This by and large is not the worst book on the list. It gets points for originality in that these people are from Florida rather than a major US city, and yet somehow no one is doing bath salts or fighting gators. There is no propositioning of our heroine for a three-month sexual relationship, and yeah, I don't know, that's pretty much it. That being said, I have literally no idea how to rate this book, so moving on. Number four, The Coincidence of Callie and Caden by Jessica Sorensen. So I tried to read this book a couple of months before I even had the idea to film this video, and I thought it sucked. Our heroine was a rape victim and our hero was being physically abused by his father. And while these things definitely do happen in real life, and while it's not something that I think needs to be excluded from a romance, the ways in which this book handled these topics from what I read of them felt a little trauma porn-y and it just wasn't something that I personally wanted to read about. I think Wait For You by Jay Lynn or Jennifer L. Armentrout is definitely a better version of this. I'm bothered. Number three, Bear Do You by Sylvia Day. It seems like everyone who likes this book really likes to reject the Fifty Shades of Grey comparisons, but it's almost exactly the same with a few glossy changes to lull you into a false sense of security. So this book is about another rich, clumsy white lady who starts as an ad agency intern to earn her way, which I think we're supposed to sympathize with, but reading it in 2020 just felt completely tone deaf and reminded me a lot of a tweet that I saw about a lady who learned of the travel ban and thought the solution was using her unpaid Iranian interns to sew cashmere sweaters that said, I miss Barack for her wealthy friends to wear because she's a woke self-made girl boss. Anyway, aforementioned book lady runs into some absolutely magnetic panty dropper on her way to work. And yes, this man is rich and owns the entire building. But here's where this book differs from Fifty Shades. It tries to make our main character, Eva, Ava, completely unrelatable. We're supposed to believe that she is not a Mary Sue because she's not the girl next door. She has a rockin' body, platinum hair, and a passion for Krav Maga, not classic literature. That, coupled with her desire for financial independence despite having really rich parents, is supposed to give her some sort of likability, but I found myself rolling my eyes very fucking hard. The worst part is the book wasn't any better for those changes, and in a lot of ways it was worse for the changes that it does make. Both our hero and our heroine have trauma in their pasts, and it was pretty evident while reading that this was just supposed to garner likability and sympathy for our main characters. This book was just flavorless and poorly written, and overall the book was just lazy. At least Fifty Shades was fun. This book had me bothered, and lines like, romance isn't in my repertoire, but a thousand ways to make you come are, really solidifies this book for me as hot garbage. Number two, Dark Lover by J.R. Ward. This is the first book in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series, which if you didn't know, is a best-selling vampire romance series, which has like 18 books now, I wanna say. And the first book of the series opens with a bang, because there's a car bomb that incinerates our hero's best friend. So Dark Lover tells the story of the vampire Wrath, who 
is the king of all of the vampires, and he is also a member of the Black Dagger Brotherhood, which is charged with protecting the vampire race from lessers, who are soulless humans who are trying to kill the vampires. Wrath ends up falling for a girl named Beth, who is a half-human. Wrath was asked to basically help Beth through her transition into a vampire, because if she doesn't get his blood, she will end up dying. This book is filled with 2000s charm, memory erasing, and good old-fashioned cervical spray painting. After five rereads, it's hard to look at this book with any degree of objectivity, but I will say that while I love this story, I don't necessarily love the sexual component of it. There was a lot of time focused on the plot that we don't get the requisite relationship building that I think would have made the sex super hot in this book. That being said, this was a lot hotter and a lot steamier than a lot of the books on this list, so I'm gonna put it just like one notch below hot. It's good, but the other books in the series are better, so if you're looking for a good recommendation from this video, please go read this book. And finally, number one, Born in Fire by Nora Roberts. Finally, we have come to the end of this godforsaken list. From what I read of this book, which albeit wasn't a lot, it had a very 80s, 90s romance feel. Like everything about this book screamed the peach candle skit from SNL, which I guess is not that surprising because this book was published before I was born. But the gist is that this fiery Irish sculptor slash painter Maggie is just begging to be tamed by art collector and gallery owner Rogan. She's also trying to run away from her past because at the beginning of this book, we see her talking to her dad as he's dying on the side of a cliff, and her mom is just a big ol' bitch, and her sister is a littler bitch. I will say this book gets bonus points for having a cover that vaguely resembles a puckered butthole, and for being the last book on this list. But from what I read of it, I am bothered. So what did I learn from this experience? I'm not quite sure. You know, I went into this with the best of intentions. I was really hoping that I'd get at least five books on this list to recommend to you guys, and I don't even have five recommendations. The three that I ended up really enjoying were Dark Lover, Eden Brook, and A Kingdom of Dreams. Everything else is pretty much a crapshoot. And if I could give you some words of advice, it is please think long and hard before you read a romance that was written before 2015. And if you're going to pick a list to read from, do not, do not pick one from BuzzFeed. Thank you and good night.